The farmhouse my wife and I purchased was an unbelievable bargain. The result of an extensive online search for the cheapest rural home we could find. We couldn't understand why this particular house was priced so low. That was until we looked on a map and saw how secluded it was. Only attached to the mainland by a single bridge with just one small village nearby, we would be far out in the middle of nowhere. Still, we decided to acquire it, hoping for an adventure of sorts. What we didn't realize, what we never would have guessed, was that by purchasing the place we had become unwitting contestants in a game. A game being run by some of the richest and most powerful people on Earth. The world's deadliest reality TV show. The Killing Game. 7734, that's it, slow down! I slammed my foot down hard on the brakes, everything in the back of the moving truck shifting forward, and I winced as I heard boxes and furniture loudly topple over. The sounds of a thousand small items scattering everywhere. <sighs> Great. Christine sighed as I pulled the truck into the long gravel driveway, having slowed down just in time. You could have just turned around and come back, you know. Yeah, I know. I said, exhausted from the drive and too tired to argue the point. The gravel crunched beneath the wheels of the big moving truck as we rolled up the long driveway towards our new home. I eyed the crooked branches, hanging low from the trees above, looking ready to puncture the top of the moving truck and void my precious security deposit. I listened closely for the sound of scraping against the box and prepared to slam on the brakes again if necessary. A sign hanging from a short wooden post on the left proclaimed the name of the property. Carved into the placard with a careful hand were the words, Kilgore Farm. Hmm, well isn't that a fun name for the place? I said, trying to make light of the bad omen. Cornrows stood high on the right side of us, bending slightly in the breeze, an identical gap between each one. To the left was a small pond, a scattering of trees, their leaves just beginning to turn yellow, and eventually the old brick farmhouse itself came into view, appearing out of the trees ahead on the left. Beyond the house was a well-used barn, looking old and weather-worn, flecked with faded red peeling paint. Further past that, the gravel road led even deeper into the property. There'd be acres and acres of land if we drove past the barn. Mostly forests and hay fields. And yet somehow we had gotten it for an incredible bargain. It was as if no one wanted to live here, despite all the beauty which surrounded the place. As I drove up the country lane towards our new home, I couldn't help but admire the scenery. It seemed like the sky was bigger and bluer here. Like the sun shone brighter and the air was crisper and fresher. Forests and rolling fields were all that could be seen for miles. Christine and I had both grown up on big farms as kids, before moving to large cities, and had fantasized about one day moving back out onto the land and fending for ourselves. The trouble is, we had no idea what we were in for. I brought the truck to a stop and we got out, stretching our legs and our backs. It had been a long drive from the city, but we weren't going back. At least, that's what we told ourselves. I still can't believe this place is ours, my wife said, breathing in the country air and looking up at the big house. We lived too far away to come see the place in person prior to moving. So we'd settled for pictures and a video tour of the house, scoping out every angle on Google Earth and Street View, snapping it up before anyone else noticed what a bargain it was. The two of us worked remotely, 
and didn't need to commute, making the isolated homestead the perfect place to settle down and start a family. Sure, there were no neighbors for miles, no Walmarts or McDonald's, no 24-hour convenience stores or, well, you get the picture. We were in the boonies, in the sticks. We were in the country, damn it. But now that we were here looking at the house, it felt unsettled, restless. The big old house had a presence about it, an aura, that I didn't very much like at all. Big windows looked down like jealous eyes from the second floor. The porch an angry, teeth-gritting mouth. Ivy ran down the rear of the house like the long, dark hair of a witch, and along the crumbling bricks of the chimney. I noticed a great many birds circling and cawing overhead, but they weren't the good kind. Ravens and crows looked down at us as they flew in lazy spirals above. Scarecrows stood watch like sentries, guarding the corn in the neighboring field, just on the other side of the driveway. Huh, I said, not sure what I wanted to get out. It's a little creepy looking, isn't it? Christine said. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. It's probably just new house jitters. The front door unlocked with an effort and I turned the rusted doorknob. It squealed and swung open, and the sound echoed back from the shadows of the squalid, empty old house. No one had bothered to clean the place in quite some time, I realized. The pictures we had seen online had either been taken many years prior, or had been heavily photoshopped. We'd been scammed, in other words. The place was not quite a disaster, but it was in rough shape. The floors and windows were filthy with dust and years of neglected grime. The bare wooden floorboards were water-stained, broken, and missing in pieces. Leaves had blown in at some point in the past and had been left in heaped piles here and there. And the entire house had a haunted eerie feeling to it as we walked around, inspecting the money pit we had purchased. I couldn't help but feel like eyes were on the back of my neck at all times, watching us closely. But from where? Inside the walls? It sure felt that way. It's gonna take some work, my wife said as she put a hand on my back reassuringly. I have never been able to hide my emotions, and I could only imagine what she saw written across my face in that moment. I guess we better clean up a bit before bringing anything inside. She agreed, and we went out to the truck, hoping to find a broom and some garbage bags amidst all the stuff we had packed. But before I could get back to the truck, something stopped me dead in my tracks. Sitting on the front porch was now an immaculately gift-wrapped package. I almost tripped over it going back out the door and looked down at it with confusion. We'd only been inside for a minute. And the present hadn't been there when we went in, I was sure of that. Hello? I called out, stepping wide around the box as if it were a bomb, instead of a housewarming gift with a red satin ribbon tied neatly around it. The big box was covered in blue wrapping paper, imprinted with sports imagery. Baseball bats and soccer balls, hockey sticks and footballs. Who are you talking to? Christine saw the box and smiled. What's that? Did you... how did you sneak that into the truck without me seeing it? She bent down to pick it up. What's with the wrapping paper? Wait, I said, grabbing her arm. That's not mine. Someone just left it. I guess they ran off. Christine didn't seem to know what to make of that at first. She looked like she almost didn't believe me. I'm serious. Why would anyone... She went over the driveway and began to look around, putting her hand over her eyes to block the glare. 
as she examined the property looking for intruders. After a few long moments, she came back, holding herself tightly and looking uneasy, her eyes darting from side to side. Why would anyone do that? She asked, eyes fixed on the box. I don't know. Just shy neighbors. Wanted to drop off a housewarming present, but they were in a hurry. I don't know, I'm as confused as you, and not just by the wrapping paper. Looks like something you give to a ten-year-old boy on his birthday. My words sounded hollow even to my own ears. In the end, we both settled on opening it. We began to unwrap the gift right on the front porch. Christine untied the ribbon and hesitantly tore the wrapping paper, revealing a plain, unpainted wooden box. The top was a lid, attached by brass hinges and a clasp. My shaking hand reached to open it when suddenly I heard tires crunching up the gravel driveway, and a car horn began to honk erratically, piercing my eardrums with a loud noise. I looked up to see Tom behind the wheel of our old car, a big, goofy grin on his face. Greg and Sarah were with him. They were coming up the driveway, arriving late as usual. They had lost us on the highway, but had found the place eventually using GPS. The two of us left the box unopened on the front porch, forgetting about it for the time being, as we went over to greet our friends who had driven halfway across the country, following after us, to help us move and to see us off. The box ended up half forgotten until later that evening. There was only so much light left in the day, after all. And the priority was to clean up and get everything moved inside. Night would be coming soon. And there was so much to do. Yo, this place is gonna need a fresh coat of paint, Tom said, putting his size 13 shoes up on the coffee table and sipping a cold beer. Not to mention a few other things. Foosball table, for sure. Right over there in that corner. We'd just finished bringing everything inside, and we were all sitting down in the living room, surrounded by boxes, out of breath and exhausted. We'd cleaned the place for hours, sweeping, mopping the floors, and washing the walls as well as we could. Only after that had we moved everything else inside. It had taken twice as long due to the unexpected state of the place, but we were finally finished. At least for the time being. It's their place, not yours, Sarah said, elbowing him. As if Christine wants a frickin' foosball table in the middle of her living room. Normally this would be when the host would order pizza for everybody. But there's nothing like that out in our isolated countryside now. So we had to settle for some hot dogs we had ready in the cooler for just this occasion. I cooked them up on our stovetop grill that we usually used for camping, and brought them out on a plate for everyone. There's this little town nearby, it's, I don't know, it's more of a village, really. Weird name. Saint, uh, Saint Ad Adjudicator or something? I was saying. Saint Adjutor, Christine said, correcting me. Yeah, we stopped at the general store there. Uh, I don't know, I'll bet they have paint, whatever else we might need to do a few more things around here tomorrow. I said, sitting down and eating a bite of hot dog. <sighs> Markup will be brutal, though. Tom nodded, saying he was happy to help out. He'd be a good person to have around for assistance with a few quick repairs and renovations, since he'd become quite the handyman over the years. I took another bite of hot dog and felt something crunch inside my mouth, between my teeth. A strange taste was there as well, coppery and unpleasant, and a grittiness that settled on my tongue but didn't go away. Feeling disgusted but curious if I had chipped a tooth, perhaps, I spit out the bite of hot dog and looked in my hand worriedly. In my palm was the face of a small, unborn chicken. I had bitten down hard on its beak. Bile rising in my gullet, I looked at the rest of the hot dog in my hand. In the sausage casing were partially developed claws and the body of a fertilized chicken egg which had been stuffed inside. Chunks of the fetal bird's body parts trickled out onto the wet floor. With sloppy sounds. I threw it to the ground and ran to the bathroom to puke. 
Tom had also taken a bite of his and did likewise, spitting into the sink while I hugged the filthy porcelain throne. When I got back, my bewildered and disturbed friends asked where I had gotten the horror show hot dogs from. The answer? The local general store. They had been the manager's special when we stopped there on the way through town. We definitely wouldn't be buying those again. I didn't want to go back there at all after that. We didn't have much choice. It was the only place around for miles where you could get most items. Eventually, this disgusting bit of business receded from our conversation as we tried to change the topic quickly. I hoped it had been an ill-fated mistake on some distracted butcher's part. But that was hard to imagine. It seemed blatantly intentional. The house was dimly lit with a few lamps, and we turned on music to distract us. It played in the background as dusk began to turn to darkness outside. The five of us ate chips and chocolate bars we bought from a rest stop along the way, scared to eat anything else from the general store. We drank cold beer and laughed like old times. I realized with a sinking heart that this would be the last time I would see them all for quite a while. I couldn't help but think about how much I would miss them all once they left. And then Tom saw the wooden box. It was sitting separate from everything else. The bow stuck haphazardly to the top of it. What's this? he asked. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah... We haven't had time to open it yet, just some housewarming present one of the neighbors brought over. Tom walked over to it while I was grabbing a drink from the case and while Christine was looking through the playlist for a different song. Neither one of us saw him open it. But as I was coming back into the living room from the kitchen, I heard his scream. High and shrill and completely unlike his normal voice. And then I heard the loud bang as the box hit the floor and toppled over. Something heavy and round, rolling out of it. At first I thought it was a bowling ball, but then I looked closer and saw that those were not finger holes, but eye sockets, staring back at me from the round, flesh-colored thing on the floor. Empty, cavernous eye sockets. Dark and hollow. It was the decapitated head of someone familiar, I realized. It was hard to be sure at first without the eyes. They say the eyes are the window to the soul, after all. Staring at it, rolling back and forth on the ground, it dawned on me whose face it was. It was Tom's head. The same Tom who was right there looking horrified on the other side of the room. Or so I thought. I would recognize my best friend anywhere, surely. Even without his eyes. What's happening? Are they answering? My wife was pacing frantically, her eyes wide with unbridled fear. The coppery smell of blood still hung in the air, and we were all standing around the living room of our newly acquired farm home, suddenly wishing we had never left the city. I couldn't get the image of the decapitated head out of my mind, despite or perhaps because I had personally stuffed it back into the gift box, unable to stand looking at it for one second longer. I kept seeing flashes of it whenever I blinked, the dark sunken holes where eyes should have been, and the uncanny resemblance it bore to my best friend Tom, who I had been sure was sitting across the room from me. Now I didn't know what to think. This looked like Tom, it sounded like him. His mannerisms and his speech, everything was identical to how I remembered. I felt like he was the real McCoy, but if that was the case, then whose head was in the box we just found on our doorstep? It was just a weird chiming sound, and then it hangs up and goes back to the dial tone again, Greg said, sounding more and more uneasy by the second. What the hell, Jordan, you try pulled out my own phone and dialed 911. 
A foreign-sounding tone blared in my ear painfully. Then a friendly voice recited, We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please try again later. It's not working, this is insane. How could 911 be out of service? The darkness outside was total by this point. The highly reflective windows inside the house blocking any chance of seeing details outside. Looking out there, unable to see anything but the glare of the lamplights inside, a terrifying thought occurred to me. We need to lock the doors. Turn the lights out. Whoever did this, they're still out there. They could be watching us right now. Christine ran to the front door and I ran to the back, pulling the deadbolt closed and checking the windows as well. All locked. I went back to the living room and thought carefully about where else they could come in. Sarah was going around, turning off all the lights except for the dimmest ones, leaving just enough light to see our way around. Somehow this didn't make me feel any better. These demons seemed to be hiding in every shadow now. Darkness would conceal us from anyone watching, but it would also hide them from us if they were already inside, hiding somewhere in the house. The thought made me shudder. I'll go upstairs and check the windows, I said, mustering my courage. Can somebody go down to the basement and make sure there's no other way for anybody to get in? I'm on it, said Greg. It's not me, man, it's not me. Tom was saying to Sarah over and over again. Why does it look like me? His eyes were wild and unfocused, darting around the room suspiciously. The resemblance was too striking to be a coincidence. From the shaved head to the eyebrow piercing, the jawline and the prominent cheekbones. The decapitated head we'd discovered in the box was an exact replica of his own. An identical twin. And yet Tom had no twin brother, no siblings at all. It made no sense. I ran upstairs, going quickly to each window to see if they were locked. All of them except for one. One window was half open on the second floor letting in a chill, early night breeze with a hint of cow manure. I wandered over to it and pulled out the piece of wood which was propping it open, then slowly began to ease the old window pane down to close it. Something stopped me. That feeling of being watched once again, but stronger now. It was dark upstairs, and without the glare of the lights I could see out the window into the cornfield below. I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. After a few seconds of close examination, I was sure. A dark figure was standing just at the edge of the cornfield, looking up at me. My heart turned to ice in my chest as I looked down at him and saw nothing but shadows, where his face should have been. What do you want from us? I shouted at the shadowy figure outside, momentarily more angry than afraid. What do you want from us? They didn't reply. After a long while, they wordlessly turned away and began to slowly walk into the corn rows. The corn stalks swayed to the side, leaving a gap where the person walked. As they moved off into the field, their shoulders wider than the rows. My breath caught in my throat as I stared at the window. There were a dozen other dark shapes, which cut their own paths through the corn as well, moving in the same direction away from the house. They had been watching us too, I just hadn't noticed them. Horrified, I couldn't turn away as they pushed their way through the corn, making similar shadowy shapes through the field with their footpaths. I tried to count their numbers and got close to a dozen before they disappeared into the darkness one by one. What could they possibly want from us? I wondered. Would they be back? Something told me yes. Another scream resounded through the house and I ran downstairs to see what the source of it could be. The old wooden steps creaked as I raced back downstairs. When I got down to the main floor of the house, Christine and Sarah were looking as concerned as I did, and were at the basement door looking down. It was hanging open, revealing the darkness beneath the house. 
Are you okay, Greg? I called down, afraid to take a step further until he called back, saying he was safe. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's just a stupid mannequin thing. I thought it was a person down here. I called back up. Mannequin? I mouthed to Christine. She shrugged. Alright, I'm gonna go down there and see what's going on. I said, then pulled her aside and spoke quietly. So I saw people outside. At least a dozen of them. They were walking away through the cornfield. A dozen of them? Who the hell are they? What do they want? I shook my head to say I didn't know. Alright, I'm gonna go down and get Greg, and then we're all gonna stay together after that for protection. No more splitting up. We need to find whatever makeshift weapons we can in those boxes. See if you can distract Tom with that. Get him to stop thinking about the whole... head thing. Be careful. I'll keep trying 911. Staring down the steep old wooden staircase, I took a deep breath and began to descend into the cooler air of the basement. Each step creaked loudly beneath my feet, the planks bending beneath my weight, and I pictured myself breaking through and falling to the ground below, ripping the flesh of my legs on broken, splintered boards, and shattering my ankles on landing. I imagined my femur, broken and sticking out through the skin, arterial blood spraying as I writhed on the dirt-packed floor. I shook my head and tried to clear that grisly image away, then continued walking down the ancient stairs. Greg? I called out. There was nothing at first, and I imagined not his voice calling back from the darkness, but the voice of something else. Something dry bloodless, long dead and forgotten. Yeah, over here, he said finally. As I got down to the basement level, I saw that it was not empty. Someone had left a great many things down there to gather dust in the darkness below the house. The previous owners, I guessed. You see all this stuff? Greg asked, pointing at a large gothic dollhouse he had found. I turned and nearly screamed at the same mannequin that had scared him so badly. There was a long-haired wig on its head, turned around backwards so that its face was half covered and tangled, knotted strands. It seemed to stare at us from behind this obstructive curtain of hair. I turned my eyes away from that with an effort, staring in amazement at the wide variety of items that had been left behind. Among them, I spotted a few things which caught my eye. There were old baseball cards, a stuffed wolf posed to look as if it were howling, a porcelain doll the size of an eight-year-old child, dressed in Victorian errant clothing, a ventriloquist dummy, a knight's suit of armor, and a couple dozen board games, to name a few things that stood out from the jumble. The board games were odd, I noticed, as I inspected them more closely. They looked like the classic ones from my childhood, but instead of the usual names, they were imperceptibly different. Dungeons and Darkness was written on the top one. It was like everything in this place was slightly unhinged, almost imperceptibly different from how it should have been. The taxidermy wolf's mouth just slightly too large, its teeth too long too sharp. The mannequin with its naked body, the skin almost real looking, if not for the hinged joints and stiff posture. I glanced at the ventriloquist dummy, half expecting it to stand up and begin to march towards me, but it just continued to stare lifelessly forward. Hey, Jordan, Greg whispered conspiratorially, what do you think is the deal with the head? Be real with me, man. Did you put it there? That's all I can figure out is this is some big prank you're pulling on us. It's not a prank. I'm as freaked out as you guys are. How the hell could I make a head like that? Look, I don't understand this either. It, it looks like Tom, but it wasn't him, obviously, unless he's got a freaking twin brother he never told us about. Maybe a long-lost twin brother. Shit, man, I don't know. You know what I wonder, said Craig. Maybe it is him. Like, 
from the future. He mimed his brain, exploding with a flick of outstretched fingers of the temple. Like freaking Looper, man. Like time traveling assassins and shit. Dude, were you chewing mushrooms again? What the hell are you talking about? He waved me off and walked away back towards the stairs, mumbling to himself. I took another quick look at the strange assortment of characters that were arranged, or had perhaps arranged themselves, at this end of the basement. They looked closer suddenly. No. Just my imagination, surely. A trick of the light. Holy shit, check this out! Turning reluctantly away from the disturbing relics, I went over to him. And as I turned away, did the ventriloquist dummy blink? Its eyes suddenly shifting. Its head turning almost imperceptibly. I turned back to look and couldn't be sure, but I thought that indeed it had. I think we should go back upstairs, I said, hearing the tremor in my voice. We gotta stick together. A quick look around revealed no windows had been left open, and that was why we had gone down there after all, wasn't it? To close the windows, to secure the house? But then I saw why he was so keen on me coming over to see what he was looking at. It was another box. This one covered in pink wrapping paper with princesses and fairies all over it. The present had been left at the bottom of the stairs where we had just entered. And yet it hadn't been there when we came in. I was sure of that once again. Did you put this here? He asked, suspicion creeping back into his voice. I shook my head emphatically, looking with fearful eyes at the new box that had just appeared. Whoever's down here, stop fucking with us and show yourself! Greg shouted. I immediately wished he hadn't. But then nobody came out from the shadows, and my instincts told me we were alone in the room, aside from all the creepy relics which had been left behind. We spun around with our cell phone flashlights, but the entire basement was empty. There's nobody down there but us. I picked up the box reluctantly. It was heavy for its size, but not as heavy as the other package had been. Something almost round, but not quite rolled around lumpily inside. An object crashed and toppled over at the other end of the room near the mannequin. Greg and I looked over to there to see the thing that had moved several feet from its previous location was looking right at us. The large doll, dressed in Victorian clothing, was now turned to face us. Ez was the ventriloquist dummy. With fear blooming in my belly, I noticed the taxidermied wolf with the very large teeth, was now entirely missing from its pedestal. Let's go upstairs, I said to Greg, not mentioning this fact. Not sure if I even believed it myself. When we got upstairs, I saw that Tom was still staring catatonically at the box on the table. I felt terrible about it, but I moved it aside to make room for the new one, the one we had just found in the basement. It was at the bottom of the stairs when we tried to come back up here. It just appeared out of thin air. Christine's eyes darted to the basement door. I had pulled the deadbolt closed, but it looked flimsy and weak. There's nobody down there. We checked. Tom's eyes had suddenly regained a flicker of life. And he looked different now. Open it. What? No, Tom, this isn't like the other box. We don't... We don't know what's going to be in here, but we know it's not going to be good. It could be a bomb. It could be another head, for all we know. But either way, this is evidence. We need to leave it for the police to open. Look, who knows what clues we might have destroyed the first time. Fingerprints? DNA? God knows what else. Tom got to his feet. I never seen him look so angry, and I realized with alarm that he was angry with me. I gotta know. He said, stomping over to the box and pushing me aside. Tom hadn't played football for a long time, but when he had, he'd bruised and beaten anyone in his path to get to the end zone. And he was doing the same thing now. I tried to stop him, but he tore it open, unlatching the clasp, throwing open the lid. He looked inside and gasped. 
his shaking hands closed the box again, and his eyes went straight to Sarah, the love of his life. His high school sweetheart, who he'd married right after college. They'd always been inseparable for as long as I could remember. But still, there was mistrust in his eyes when he looked at her. Sarah? She got up and walked over on shaking legs to look inside the box for herself. And Sarah pulled the head out of the box, looking determined to see it in the light. Despite the blood pouring out from the stump at the base of it, all over her arms, covering her with gore, she held it up. She stared at the hollow blackness where her newfound twin's eyes should have been. Her legs folded beneath her like a broken beach chair as she suddenly passed out, hitting her head on the dining room table on her way down. Blood began to leak from a gash on her scalp, her eyes fluttering but mostly closed. Her breathing shallow. Shit, shit, shit! I grabbed a handful of paper towels and held them tightly to her head, trying to stop the bleeding. Head wounds always look worse than they are, I told myself, but there's a lot of blood. It's fine. She's fine. Get off of her! Tom shouted, pushing me out of the way. He grabbed the paper towels and held them roughly to her bleeding forehead, staring angrily at me as if this was my fault somehow. What do we do? Christina asked, dialing 911 again. It's not working. Should we try to run? She was right. The most logical thing to do at this point was to make a break for the car and drive into town. Get to the cops and bring them back to the house try to catch whoever was doing this to us. Whoever was tormenting us. There had to be a police station in town. I knew it. What about Sarah? You can't just leave her here like this. He's right, said Greg. You two go. The two of us will stay with Sarah. Get help, just... Just don't forget to come back for us, okay? I stood up reluctantly and looked at Christine. She nodded and we made for the door, hoping that there wouldn't be a dozen shadowy figures waiting for us just outside. Christine and I spared one last glance over our shoulders as we prepared to leave the house to get help. For all I knew, a dozen shadowy figures tormenting us were waiting just outside. Tom was still holding pressure against Sarah's head wound, and Greg stood by the front window looking out. It looks clear. Now's your chance. Go! Moments after we stepped foot outside the house, dark figures began to emerge from the corn. They were human-shaped shadows against the swaying backdrop of corn stalks, bending in the wind behind them. Errant leaves blew past as we stared across the driveway at them, like war parties facing off at the DMZ. The pale blue moonlight was just enough to see them. All of them. At least a dozen, maybe more. They stepped purposefully out into the open, and I saw that each of them held a curved, sickle-like blade, a golden medallion hanging around each of their necks. Staring at them was like looking across the gravel road at a dozen grim reapers. We knew without question that they intended to kill us. Christine screamed and spun around, but Greg had already slammed the door closed and locked it a second earlier, not seeing what was emerging from the corn. We hammered on the door with our fists and our palms, but Greg didn't open it. I looked over my shoulders and saw the dark figures were approaching, coming closer, but in no real hurry. The sickles swung playfully from their hands as they walked patiently across the gravel driveway, wearing what I saw now were long black robes with drawn hoods. Let us in, they're going to kill us! Christine began to bang on the front door of the house while I banged on the window, and we looked in to see Greg scrambling towards the door, as if only now hearing the commotion. 
He threw the door open and we rushed in, and Greg slammed it shut and locked it just as we saw the black hooded figures inches from entering. As I spun the lock shut, I felt the strong grip of someone's hand on the doorknob on the other side, trying to resist my efforts. I felt the deadbolt slide into position just in time. What the hell, man? I screamed, shoving him. You almost got us killed out there. I wanted to punch Greg in the face, but as he looked at us, it seemed as if he hadn't even heard our pounding on the door. I was just pretending not to. He shoved me back, and I almost did punch him, but then Christine stepped between us and put up her hands. Stop it, both of you. This is what they want. This is exactly what they want. What who wants? Greg shouted. The dozen fucking people with knives outside who are trying to kill us. I saw them from upstairs earlier and... The... What? You what? I stopped, speechless, not sure what Greg was mad about now, but then I realized I'd never told him or any of them what had happened at how I'd seen the figures outside. I assumed Christine had told Tom and Sarah, but no. Now that I looked at his face, I saw the same thing. Neither one of them had known. And we were about to leave them there, oblivious to this massive danger right outside. I, I just thought that... I, I didn't... Everything happened so fast, and... And so you thought you could just leave us here with a fucking kill squad? A bunch of weird fuckers outside carrying knives? Slipped your mind? Some friend you are, man. When this shit is over, I'm going to be happy to never see your face again. That stung. On top of it all, I looked over and saw Sarah was also now awake, and the look she was giving me said it all. She was shaking her head with confused disappointment. It didn't matter what I said, I realized anything would sound like an excuse. It was hopeless trying to convince them. Resigned to their anger, I took a seat on a free chair and looked out the window anxiously again. There's only blackness out there. No sign of anyone. A loud creaking sound broke the silence. My heartbeat sped up, noting the familiar noise, the basement door squealing on its hinges. Did you guys forget to close the basement door? Christina asked as if such a trivial thing could be important at such a time as this. And yet it was important, I knew that instinctively and without hesitation. My mind went to the toys downstairs, the mannequin, the ventriloquist dummy and that wolf mysteriously missing from its pedestal. Close it, I said immediately. Close it right now. But it was already too late. The sound of soft paws padding quietly up the stairs could be heard. Close. The taxidermied wolf was coming up the stairs. It had to be. breath. I waited with my breath held for hell to break loose. But then it didn't. Standing up on shaking legs, I walked over to the basement door from my seat in the living room. There was no wolf. No ventriloquist dummy or mannequin climbing the stairs. No. Those things weren't possible. What was happening outside was hard enough to believe without that. And not to mention the severed heads of my friends being delivered, gift-wrapped in boxes to us. Considering those same people were still living and breathing in the same room, it just seemed to be one surreal event occurring after another. We couldn't catch our breath. And I wondered if perhaps that was their plan whoever they were. Are you okay, Jordan? Asked Christine. You're acting really weird. I barely heard her. The dark abyss beneath the house stared up at me teasingly. I slammed the door shut and pulled the deadbolt closed once again. 
I remember doing that the first time without any mistake in my mind. Someone had opened it. Did one of you open this door? I asked, trying not to sound accusatory, but hearing the way it came out, I didn't bother to apologize. Because I know I locked it. And there's some weird shit down there that I don't like the look of one bit. My friends looked at me with their brows furrowed. Sarah was shaking her bleeding head, and Tom looked ready to knock me out cold. Even Christine looked confused. Slightly worried. No, man, none of us opened the door. Tom said, his words laced with malice and anger. We had other things on our minds? Like Sarah's head wound? Before I could say anything back, there was a loud gonging noise upstairs. It sounded like an old grandfather clock. I counted twelve times that it went off, each one louder than the one before, until my ears were aching and it felt like sharp pins inside of them digging into my eardrums. I looked at my cell phone. Midnight. Why did that fill me with such utter dread? Was it perhaps because we didn't own a grandfather clock? Because we hadn't seen one anywhere inside the house? The front door now began to turn and the whole doorway began to rattle and shake with a violent pounding force. And then a sharp banging sound ensued as if someone were trying to kick it in. The picture window just beside us smashed in, the giant rock coming through and landing on the living room floor with a bang. I grabbed Christine by the arm and yelled at the rest of them to follow us. The clock striking midnight had triggered something, it seemed. They were coming in. Upstairs looked like the safest bet since there were windows we could escape through if necessary. Greg, Tom, and Sarah followed after us just as the shadowy, hooded figures began to form near the window, knocking the shards of broken glass aside with their knives so they could climb through. Terrified, I ran up the stairs, unable to help but notice that the basement door was once again hanging open and ajar. Once I got to the second floor, I looked back to see everyone else behind me. Then there was the sound of footsteps coming in through the window in the living room. I knew they were inside. I went to the first door on the left at the top of the stairs, opening it for Christine and Sarah to go inside. She went in quickly, and Sarah went in after her. But then suddenly it slammed shut with great force. I barely got my arm out of the way in time, but I knew it wasn't one of them who had closed it. Was this place possessed? Was that why boxes filled with severed heads were appearing? And dark figures with long knives were coming from the cornfield? Were they merely apparitions? Something told me they were not. I had felt the hard, objective reality of the gift boxes for myself. And not to mention ghosts don't break glass windows, clearing away shards from the frame carefully so they don't cut themselves. And they don't carry knives. All of those things had been done with the practiced efficiency of someone who had done this before. That was what frightened me the most. They were coming up the stairs, and I ran to the next door, throwing it open. Tom went inside, pushing me out of the way angrily. We were about to follow after him when the door slammed shut behind him, just as the other one had a moment before. It was just Greg and I left in the hallway and only one door remained on this end of the floor. The bathroom on the right. I threw the door open and let Greg go in first, seeing the first of the hooded figures beginning to reach the top of the stairs. Once we were in the bathroom, the door quickly slammed shut behind me without any effort on my part. Then the door lock clicked over to the right as if pulled by an invisible hand. A second later, there was a sound of people at the door rattling the doorknob. They began to bang on it with their body weight, trying to break it open. I held it closed with my hands and assumed Greg would come to assist me, but he didn't. Help me, man. What are you doing? He didn't respond. And I glanced back over my shoulder to see he was looking at something on the floor. An opened wooden box. With wrapping paper all around it. The thing was sitting in front of the toilet the inside drenched in shadows 
from where I stood in the dim room. Suddenly the pounding noise stopped and I heard a brief, stifled scream from the other side of the door. Then the sounds of gurgling, wet, sloppy sounds of things falling to the floor. Blood began to puddle and pool underneath the door and across the threshold, soaking the ivory-white tiles and crimson. I couldn't help but wonder who was losing all that blood on the other side of the door. Hopefully not Tom or Christine. Was it someone else? Was there someone out there helping us and dispatching our attackers? The scream had been muffled, so I couldn't be sure. But it hadn't sounded like someone I knew. Greg didn't even seem to hear. He was lost in whatever was happening on the other side of the bathroom. Whatever was inside the box. I noticed the gift wrap was covered in pens, pencils, and typewriters. Uh, The significance of that was lost on me until later. He pulled the object out of the wooden box almost triumphantly like a hunter after bagging a small animal. He held up the severed head by the hair, and it dangled down, swaying by the strands. It looked so real. Just like me. Except for the eyes, of course. Just like the others, this one had no eyes. Because I have them, I thought to myself madly. A chuckle escaped my lips at that thought, and it occurred to me that was the worst thing I could have done. Greg did not think this new discovery was funny, not one bit. His face screwed up in anger as soon as I began to laugh. You're an imposter. He screamed at me, brandishing the head and shaking it by the hair as he bunched his fist, blood flying everywhere as he did so spattering his face with fine droplets. I knew it. Who the hell are you anyways? What do you want from us? I tried to lower my voice and spoke as calmly as I could. Craig, it's me. I don't know what the hell's going on either. I just need to figure this out. You saw the other boxes. You found the second one. The one you left there. I knew it was impossible. I knew it was you all along. This proves it. You're the one doing all this. Are those your friends outside? None of that made sense, of course, but it didn't seem to matter to Greg anymore. He took out a knife from his pocket that he'd been hiding the whole time. It was a switchblade that he carried. I knew this because we'd been friends since high school. He always carried it when he was worried about getting robbed or walking through rough parts of town. He came at me with his face no longer recognizable as my old friend, but now someone entirely different. Raising the knife high, he lunged at me. I grabbed his forearm, trying to hold him back. I was taller than him, but he was stronger. He quickly began to bring the blade down towards my eye. I'm going to see what's under that skin because I know you're not him. You took his eyes. Now I'm going to take him back. The blade was coming at my face. No matter how hard I struggled and pushed him with all my might, it inched closer and closer. The point of it began to get me blurry as it drew nearer to my eye, going out of focus until it filled my vision with its silvery gray sheen. My foot slipped suddenly on the slick blood beneath me, sending me flying into the air. I came down hard on my back, and Greg fell with me. As soon as we landed, I felt him go limp, heavy with dead weight. His breathing sounded wet as he laid on top of me, and I pushed him off to the blood-soaked floor. He had impaled himself with his own knife when we fell. I didn't know how it happened, and I no longer cared. I was just glad to be alive. Looking at his chest, I saw frothy blood was escaping around the hilt of the knife, impaled deep between his ribs. His face went pale and his lips began to turn blue. 
As he eventually stopped breathing, his vital fluids pooling around him and coagulating. I tried to stop the bleeding, but my efforts were useless with the limited supplies in the room. The blood kept pouring out, soaking through everything I put down. I sat trembling on the floor, unsure whether to be glad, to be alive, or sad at the loss of my friend, or both. Maybe it didn't matter anymore. Maybe nothing mattered anymore. The sounds from the hallway had ceased entirely, making me wonder if anyone was still out there. After all, hadn't I seen blood pooling from underneath the door just minutes before? The same blood I'd slipped on and which had subsequently saved my life? Putting my ear up against the door, I listened. There was nobody out there. Either that or they were being very quiet, waiting for us to come out from hiding. Perhaps the blood was just another ruse, I thought. I waited a long time before I was able to make up my mind. But eventually I decided it was either leave or stay in the bathroom forever. There was no window in this room to escape through. I had no choice. My heart pounding, I reached for the door handle and turned it to the left as quietly as I could. It swung open with a squeal much too loud for my liking. I cringed, but no one came running. Looking out into the hallway, I saw a lot of gore. It was like someone had driven a wheat thresher down the hallway and run over several people with it. There was blood everywhere and scraps of ripped black fabric, but no recognizable evidence. No clues of any kind. I stepped through the puddles of gore, shards of bone, and torn apart flesh, and opened the other door, where Tom was. It didn't matter that he had been pissed at me, we were best friends, and I wanted to make sure he was okay. Tom was curled up on the floor, halfway out of the fetal position, as if he had just been laying there like that the whole time. He stood to his feet quickly and wiped the tears from his eyes. He was covered in very small cuts, like paper cuts. They covered nearly every inch of his skin, crisscrossing his arms and face. Is it gone? Is he gone? I had no idea what he was talking about, but then I turned around and saw a small, miniature leg escaping through the doorway. About the size of the ventriloquist dummy in the basement, I thought. Tom quickly forgot about that when he saw what was behind me. I turned around and realized I should have closed the bathroom door. Greg's body was laying on the floor, still impaled with his own knife. Blood was everywhere, not just leaking from his body, but from several others, by the looks of things. Greg tried to kill me, and I started to say, but Tom would have none of it. He lunged at me with murder in his eyes. And that was when I realized there was no denying the truth. This place had set us against each other. And now, I was going to have to fight my best friend to the death in order to save my own skin. My best friend Tom attacked me, and I could tell by the look on his face that he meant to hurt me. His right fist hitting me in the cheekbone and behind the ear. I wobbled for a second, feeling discombobulated. He tackled me to the hard wooden floor and I felt a sharp pain in my back when I hit the door frame behind me. He started punching me in the face over and over again, the back of my head hit banging against the wall. What are you doing? I heard someone scream and realized it was my wife, Christine. Stop it! Stop it! You're going to kill him! She was trying to pull him off of me and he finally relented. He backed away, muttering something about how I had killed Greg. It wasn't me! I said through bruised, swollen lips and blood pouring from my nose. My left eye was starting to swell too, affecting my vision on that side. My whole face and the back of my head hurt like hell. Sarah was out in the hallway and she looked into the bathroom and saw Greg dead on the floor. Her mouth opened as if to scream, but no sound came out. And then I realized Sarah was grief struck. She got down on her knees tears pouring from her eyes, her mouth still open and lip 
trembling uncontrollably. She began stroking Greg's hair on the bathroom floor, crying and hugging his dead body. And then she saw the head. My head. It was laying on the ground near the toilet, the blank eyes staring out at us. And something like curiosity seemed to overwhelm her grief. And she almost forgot about Greg's body for a moment, crawling over to it and staring at it on her hands and knees. Like it was a cobra that could bite her at any second. Finally, after regaining her composure, she lifted up the head and started to inspect it. Another one? What does this all mean? Instead of assuming it meant I was an imposter, as I was worried she would, she did something else instead. Something I didn't expect. Sarah began to pull the flesh from the severed head's face, tearing it off in large strips. Blood, which was dark and coagulated, bloomed and poured out from where her fingertips went into the skin. She pulled and peeled away the flesh like an orange, revealing something unexpected beneath. It looked like a hard, white, plastic replica of a human skull. Beneath that, a water balloon-like sack of bloody fluid where the brain should have been was encased inside, hooked to an array of hoses leading to the skin. The head was just an extremely well-made special effect, like something from a Hollywood movie. Sarah showed it to us as if to say, Stop fighting. This is what we need to worry about. It's not just this, either. Look at this room we were trapped in. She led us over to the room that they had been stuck inside of. And opening the door, we saw the remains of the large porcelain doll dressed in Victoria air and clothing that had been in the basement. A small knife was gripped in its hand. It was in there with us when we tried... It was in here with us when they locked us inside. Damn thing tried to kill us. I saw its head was smashed open and there was an intricate looking array of electronics inside. We kicked the shit out of it, Christine said smartly. It's a fucking robot. Somebody out there is controlling these things, trying to mess with us. Kill us, or both. I thought about the mannequin and the ventriloquist dummy I had seen down in the basement as well. The latter of which had followed us upstairs and had seemingly tortured Tom with a knife. Okay. But what the hell purpose could any of this serve? I asked. What sort of maniac would do this to people? Tom took a moment to apologize for distrusting me, and I told him it wasn't his fault. Look, when Greg saw that head, he immediately thought it meant I was an imposter. That I had been the one doing this all along. They've been trying to turn us against each other, I said, realizing this now for the first time myself. And they've succeeded. Up until this moment. Tom and Sarah murmured their agreement. We need to get the hell out of here. Whoever did this is watching us. I'll bet there are hidden cameras all over this place, and if they could afford these sorts of gadgets, it could make them look so hyper-realistic, then I guess they have a lot of cash. And they won't like that we figured this all out. I don't think that's part of their plan. The four of us went quickly and quietly down the stairs to the main floor, and I unlocked the front door of the house. Christina and I went out first, then Tom and Sarah followed just behind us. We made our way as fast as we could towards the car. From the rows of corn, the dozen figures emerged once again. And I realized instantly that the hallway splattered with gore upstairs had been just another elaborate special effect. Another thing meant to terrify and disorient us. To make us second guess everything and everyone. The Reapers, as I had come to think of them, came at us with newfound urgency, no longer taking slow, purposeful strides, but running right at us. That was when I knew that this was no longer a game to them. We had figured it out. 
and now they meant to ensure that we did not escape. Tom and Sarah were lagging a little bit behind and didn't see them until it was too late. One reaper emerged from the corn just as Sarah was running past and they grabbed her hair by the ponytail, the sickle blade coming up to her throat, slit her neck, and a fountain of arterial spray shot out, her head lolling back like an empty Pez dispenser. I watched as her blood-filled mouth opened and closed like a fish out of water. They tore off the head of her body with one more quick slice from their wickedly sharp blade. Tom saw this and reacted just as I thought he would. He did not worry about the numbers or odds against him. After seeing his wife, the love of his life, die before his eyes. He spun around and let out a howl of rage. The reaper who had just killed Sarah dropped her to the ground and let her body fall limply to the grass. They swung the blade just as Tom drew near, and he tackled him to the ground. I saw blood spray in the shadows from where the blade caught Tom in the belly. He did not last long after taking down his wife's killer. The others swarmed him and began to stab and slash at him from different angles, until blood was soaking through his clothing, and he was covered in crimson. My best friend slumped limply to the grass, and I watched him breathe his last breath as I ran, looking over my shoulder and willing myself not to stop. By the time I got to the car and threw open the door, I realized Christine was lagging behind. I looked back to see her stumbling on the uneven grass and then falling. She hit the ground hard and I ran back to help her to her feet. The shadowy figures pursued us as we raced towards the car. But their numbers were lessened by the distraction of Tom's attack. If we managed to escape... It would be because he had saved us, I realized, giving his own life to do so. We both climbed into the car as quickly as we could and slammed the doors closed, just as the group of them drew near. I locked the doors with a shaking hand and tried to fumble the key into the ignition by some sheer miracle of will. My fingers seemed to no longer be my own. The damn thing kept bumping off the sides and refused to go into the slot, and I found myself holding my breath and clenching every muscle in my body as the shadowy figures scraped their blades along the windows and looked in at us, their faces drenched and hidden in the darkness. The one at my window began to clink their blade against the glass playfully as they looked down at me struggling. But then they brought their arm back as if to swing the blade down hard and break the glass. They brought it down once, hard enough to crack the glass but not shatter it. They brought it down again and a spiderweb crack spread outwards from the point of impact. One more blow and it would break, I was sure of it. Finally the key went into the ignition and as I turned it forwards the window smashed in on my left glass shattering everywhere. I gunned the engine as Christine screamed from beside me. I couldn't even manage that. My voice was caught in my throat. As the reaper came at me with his knife through the now open window, I put the car into reverse, just avoiding his deadly swing at the last second. The blade clinked off the front of the car with a loud and horrid sound. They did not react at our escape merely standing and watching as we screamed and I floored the car in reverse. After fishtailing and nearly winding up in a ditch at the side of the driveway, I managed to crack to the very last second. The silhouettes of trees and the rows of corn on the right passed by quickly in the darkness as I raced in reverse towards the end of the driveway. I spared one last glance ahead and saw the hooded figures were already gone. Back into the cornfield. What the 
hell sort of game were they playing now? I wondered. It seemed as if they were still toying with us. Had they allowed us to escape? And if so, why? Once we were on the road, I felt a little safer, but no less confused. I hit the gas and sped away down the country lane as quickly as the old shitbox would carry us. Christine gripping my leg with her hand tightly, squeezing it painfully. The two of us sat breathing heavily in silent worry as the dark forests and fields passed by outside the windows. I didn't even have to ask. I already knew Christine felt as guilty as I did. I felt like we had just let our friends die. There was a small village nearby named St. Ajuder, which contained a police station and a small general store, as well as a gas station. It had been on the way to our new house and we had wanted to check it out on the way earlier that day. I remember driving past a few quaint-looking houses and thought it looked like a normal little village. There was a grocery store with fruit stands out front, a post office and a pharmacy, a few other little shops and a fire station, and that was about it. We were a couple miles away from that village when I saw the headlights in the rearview mirror. The truck was coming up fast behind us. Much too fast. The lights were suddenly blinding as they changed to their high beams, and I flipped the mirror up to avoid looking at them. That was when the vehicle hit us from behind, causing our heads to whip painfully backwards in our seats. Terrified, I hit the gas pedal and floored it, driving as fast as I could towards the little village of St. Ajuder somewhere ahead in the distance. As fast as I was driving, the truck behind us drove faster, the engine roaring as it came up behind us on the two-lane road. Suddenly it veered and clipped the back end of our car, sending us spinning off the road. We crashed through some small bushes and shrubbery and wound up nearly slamming into a tree in the forest just off the road. I looked over and saw Christine was stunned, but awake as the vehicle had managed not to crash into anything other than a few small shrubs and some tall grass before coming to a stop. Still, the car had stalled out and wouldn't start back up again as I turned the key in the ignition again and again. The old vehicle wasn't in the best shape to begin with and the jarring impacts were bad enough to knock it out of commission. We gotta go, they're coming, Christine said, looking over her shoulder. We both opened our car doors and got out, racing into the forest on foot. As we slipped into the darkness, I looked back and saw the same people who had been chasing us before, holding long, sickle blades, racing down the slope just off the road. The sounds of the group pursuing us were not far behind. What's the plan? Christine asked quietly. I could hear the panic in her voice, but she was keeping it under control somehow, and that helped me to do the same. Same as before. We need to get to that police station. The two of us raced through the dark forest, stumbling and catching ourselves painfully on branches, unable to see without any light. Behind us, the dark figures were unseen, but we could still hear their footsteps in the stillness of the night. They could hear ours just as well. None of them carried flashlights, and they seemed to move effortlessly through the woods, not speaking to each other. It didn't take long for me to realize they were going to catch us in the forest. They were better suited to it than we were, it seemed. They had experience out in these woods in the dark, and ran as if they could see like cats in the night. I pulled Christine to the left and back towards the road. There was a plan brewing in my mind, but I wasn't yet sure if it would work. After the hard left turn, we raced through the forest until we reached the road again, then ran up a steep slope and across the gravel to the other side. We went down the grassy slope on the other side of the road. This seemed to throw off our pursuers as I heard them murmuring in the forest and I realized my plan had worked. They had lost us temporarily due to our quick change in direction. 
instead of heading right towards the village as they would expect, we went the other way. I told Christine to duck down and we crawled on all fours back towards their vehicle in the cover of the tall grass at the side of the road. It worked. They came over the ridge where the road was but couldn't see us in the darkness and in the tall grass. They continued searching deeper into the forest on this side of the road, not realizing we were now going in the opposite direction, back towards their vehicle. I only hoped they'd left their keys in the ignition, if not it would have all been for nothing. We got back near their vehicle and I realized that the end goal of my plan was doomed from the start, unfortunately. There was still someone in the truck, waiting for the other reapers, with the engine running. It would be too risky without any weapons to try and take the vehicle from him. Yeah, they crashed off the road, went into the woods, the guy was saying into a radio. Mick says we lost him, what do you want us to do? Something crackled over the walkie-talkie, but it was too garbled and static-filled to hear what they were saying. 10-4, the guy said back. He fiddled with the dial on the radio and hailed someone on the other end. Head back to the truck, Mick. Ramsey says no deviation. Let them have their fun in the village. A few minutes later, the other men came back to the truck and climbed in. They drove off after a few seconds of small talk, heading back towards the farm. To me, it sounded like a bunch of factory workers on their lunch break, rather than a squad of killers out looking for blood. The way they talked, it was like they had done this a hundred times before. My instincts told me there were a lot of lingering questions here, and I didn't even know what those questions were, let alone the answers. But at least we were safe for now. The village was still several miles away, and we had a long walk ahead of us. Mosquitoes buzzed in the night air and landed on our skin, sucking the blood from us and leaving us itchy as we marched through the grass towards St. Ajuder. What the hell did we get ourselves into? My wife asked. <sighs> I have no idea. There were miles of dark forest between us and the small village of St. Ajuder. My wife and I trudged through the fallen leaves and muck all through the night and into the early hours of the morning. I kept hearing sounds from behind us in the pitch black woods, a soft breathing occasionally or a light footstep cracking a twig and then halting abruptly at the sound. We were being followed by someone very stealthy, but whoever it was, for some reason they made no effort to attack us, and for that I was relieved, but it didn't make it any less unsettling. Eventually we stopped hearing the sounds, and I wondered if they had left us for good, or if they had just become more adept at treading softly over the forest floor. Perhaps they were getting closer by the second. Every natural sound became suspect and I nearly had a heart attack feeling palpitations for minutes afterwards when a chipmunk scurried past at one point. We came back near the road again, trying to gauge the distance left before we reached town. I saw the grass was now damp with morning dew and my eyes registered more details in our surroundings. As the village finally came into view up ahead, I realized sleepily that it was daytime. The sun had risen so insidiously behind the forest canopy and the blanket of gray clouds in the sky that I hadn't even noticed its passage over the horizon. That sign should have brought me relief after the horrors we had gone through in the darkness, but it did not. We were not out of the woods yet, so to speak. It's good news, I tried to tell myself. It had to be at least slightly reassuring to see daylight again after such a terrible night. To be honest, I hadn't even been sure we would make it through to the next day. Three of our friends certainly hadn't. Two of them had been brutally murdered right in front of us by the figures in black robes with sickle knives. 
shuddered at the horrible memory. Up ahead, the welcome sign for the small village became visible. As we approached it, I became more and more worried as to what we might encounter there. Welcome to St. Ajuter, home of the Reapers, read the sign. I didn't like that one bit. Especially since that was the name I'd given to the black-robed, hooded figures who'd been hunting us. We had barely escaped Kilgore Farm with our lives. As we walked with tired legs into town, I couldn't help but recall my first encounter with the man behind the counter at the general store in St. Ajuder. It had been our last stop on the way towards our new home the day before. I had parked the moving truck outside the general store, taking up half the street, and getting odd, frowning looks from the occasional passerby. I got the impression that they did not take kindly to out-of-towners in St. Ajuder. We were going to these people for help, and yet the village residents I had met so far left a disquiet in my heart that I couldn't ignore. So you're the ones moving into the old Kilgore place, huh? The old man had asked from behind the counter that day. What seemed like a million years ago, but was in fact just the day prior. He was dressed in faded denim overalls and was smoking a pipe, filling the room with a bluish haze of smoke. The whole store smelled like a used ashtray. I hadn't said a word yet, I was just looking at his selection of potato chips trying to decide how flexible the expiration dates were written upon them. The selection of foodstuffs in the general store was limited to hot dogs, beef jerky, gum and chips, and a few dusty chocolate bars and some off-brand soda. Other merchandise, guns, knives, and other implements of death were lined up behind the counter, and I assumed you had to ask him nicely if you wanted to look at these. Looking down the long aisles, I could see a plethora of eclectic items. Everything from garden gnomes to fireworks, floor wax to toilet seats. I saw he was still looking at me with something similar to distrust in his eyes. And I realized it wasn't distrust after all. It was distaste. Still, I nodded and said, yes. Yeah, that place been sitting empty for quite a while. You and the old missus are going to have your hands full, I imagine. Last folks moved in up there, they went and disappeared. In the middle of the night. Left most of their furniture behind, too. We had a fine little community rummage sale after that. I got that umbrella stand over there for a bargain. He said with a yellow-toothed smile, gesturing to a rusted can by the door. Why would they leave in the middle of the night? I had asked, putting money on the counter. Of course, now it was becoming quite obvious why the last owners had fled the place. Or worse. They were hunting people out on Kilgore Farm. Not only that, they were trying to get us to hunt each other. We had been lucky to get out alive. The old man had spit a liquid string of brown chewing tobacco into a receptacle behind the counter, making a ting noise as it landed in the rusty spittoon. You know, I can't really say. Some folks in town think there's a bit of a problem up at the old Kilgore house. That maybe it's... The bell above the door rang loudly as another customer had walked in. The shop owner excused himself mid-sentence, going over to assist the woman with a large order. I just figured I'd ask the guy next time I was in town, since he looked busy. But now, I was really wishing I'd gotten to hear the end of that sentence. As I came back from that memory to the present, I reminded myself to ask about the highly questionable hot dogs I purchased there as well. A manager special that I loathed to think about. I gagged and never came back to me. We're almost there, Christine said more to herself than to me. She looked exhausted, hair hanging down over her face. 
That was when the sound of a truck roaring in the distance behind us could suddenly be heard, and I spun around to see what could have been the black truck that had been chasing us the night before. They were far off in the distance, but getting closer by the second. My heart beat quickened, and I turned to look back at the town, hoping we would be close enough to escape them. Okay, we gotta run, I said, grabbing Christine's hand and heading towards the village as fast as we could. There was no sense risking hiding now, not when we were so close. Safety was just a couple hundred yards away. I could see the police station on the corner, one of the only official government buildings in town. The police cruiser was not parked out front as it had been the day prior, I noticed, and sincerely hoped that didn't mean the place was empty. Our footsteps echoed loudly in the streets of the quiet village, making us feel like trespassers in this quaint little town. But we were too exhausted and desperate to care. As we ran to the police station, I tried to pull open the door. It was locked. A sign on the glass door read, Community Policing Station. Hours of operation, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. All other hours, please dial 911. We tried that, it didn't work! I screamed. Indeed, we had been trying to call emergency services all night to no avail. It was like someone had hacked our phones to block the emergency numbers. But that seemed impossible. Christine pulled out her phone and looked at the time. It was just after 8 a.m. The sound of a large truck's engine was getting closer. Panicking, I looked around for somewhere to hide. In there, I shouted, pointing to the general store across the street. It had an open sign flashing in the window. The idea of any sort of human contact was a relief at this point. I was on the verge of screaming and shouting and waking up the whole village just to get their assistance if necessary. But I didn't want to draw attention to us in case it didn't work. As much as I believe in the kindness of strangers, reality is not always so rosy. And not only that, but the truck would be rounding the corner at any second, and the reapers could easily kill us before help could arrive. We ran across the street and opened the door, going inside the general store just as the truck was rounding the corner. It was the same vehicle from the night before, I was quite sure of it. Four tall men were inside the extended cab of the truck. They parked in front of the police station as we watched from inside the general store. As they got out, I saw they looked like ordinary men. Wearing plaid, flannel shirts, worn dungarees, and scuffed boots. Trucker caps were pulled low over their faces, obscuring their features with shadows. They went up to the police station door and looked inside, then turned around and began to look around the village with sharp eyes. Christine and I ducked down, trying to stay out of sight from where we stood just inside the general store. Welcome to St. Juder, a man said cheerily from behind the counter, seeming unconcerned with our behavior. I turned around to see it was the same guy from the day before. You folks settling in all right? A woman, I presumed his wife, was stacking up cases of off-brand soda in the corner, but she wandered over to see who was visiting the store so early in the morning. Good morning, she said, then looked us up and down and spoke to the man behind the counter. Look at the state of them, Harold. My goodness, you look like you've been dragged through the mud. Are you all right? I looked down and saw we were indeed covered in mud and dirt, leaves and broken bits of twigs hanging from our clothes in places. No, we're not all right, I said, panting and out of breath. We need help. Those men across the street... They're trying to kill us. They've been hunting us all night. The woman dropped the pan and clipboard she was carrying and they fell to the floor with a clatter. Hunting? Hunting you? Oh my, are you sure? They killed three of our friends who were helping us move, I said, realizing I'd buried the lead. That seemed to get her attention. Harold, quick, get Jim on his cell. He won't be in just yet if I know him, but quickly now, quickly. Her voice sounded honestly worried, and I felt a little better. But then I remembered the sign we had seen coming into town, only from this direction, I recalled. There hadn't been one on the way in, saying, Home of the Reapers. 
No, they saved that message for once you were heading back to the mainland, back to the only bridge that gave you passage to safety from this strange farmland community on this large, sprawling island. It made me feel uneasy knowing there was only one bridge that we could get across, the saltwater strait and back to the mainland. I would feel better once we were across it, I was sure of that much. This whole island was off-kilter, bizarro. The man behind the counter began patting his pants pockets for a phone. He Who is it that's chasing you? Is that them across the street? The woman asked, coming closer, looking out the window of the shop. Yes, those men. I'm sure. That was the truck. It has to be them. I looked out the window and saw they were coming this way. There is a storage room back there, said the woman, pointing. You can hide in there. We'll distract them as best as we can. I've got a shotgun beneath the counter, said Harold, still waiting with the phone held to his ear. If they try to cause any trouble, I'll take care of them. Don't you dare, Harold. Don't you even think about it. This could be dangerous. We ran to the storage room just to the right of the counter, and opening the door, we went inside. I didn't quite close the door behind me, but left it open just a fraction of an inch, so I could hear what was happening. A moment later, the door opened and the bell jingled overhead as the four men entered the store. Their faces were still covered in shadow as they had their hats pulled down low and wore dark sunglasses. My heart pounding with fear, I listened and waited for what would happen next. The men went to the counter and stood before it. Long knives could be seen hanging from their belts, tucked into leather scabbards. Hang on just a sec, gentlemen. I'm just finishing up a call with the chief, said Harold. Oh, hey, Jimbo. Can you get over to the store quick as you can? There was a brief pause. <laughs> You're not going to believe this, but that couple from up the street moved into Kilgore Farm? Yeah. Yeah. They say they're being hunted. Can you believe that? Well, laughter broke out amongst the four men, and I felt the staccato beat inside my chest pick up speed, hammering faster and faster. A dark feeling of dread starting to consume me. Uh, by who? Oh, you know, it's funny you should ask, because they're here right now. I think one of them might even be your brother Billy. Say, hi, Billy. I couldn't bear to listen for a moment longer. Spinning around, I looked to see if there was a way out. Christine was way ahead of me. She was already up on a shelf, testing one of the windows to see if it would open. It didn't. The whole back room was dimly lit, full of boxes of miscellaneous items. I began to move some of these over as quickly as I could, trying to barricade the door with the heaviest boxes I could find. They're in the back room. I could turn the gas on if you want. Oh, shit. Yeah, crank it up to 11, Harold. Ramsey says there's some high roller trying to bankrupt the house. She's got a fortune betting on escape. You gotta be shitting me. Ain't nobody escaping from Ramsey. That guy's a shark. Alright, I'll get the gas. I began pulling boxes out of the way again, hearing the hissing sound of gas coming from the air vents. They were gonna poison us. Christine, we gotta get out of here now. She heard the same thing I did and was now covering her nose and mouth with her shirt and was pulling boxes away from the door. As the world started to turn gray around the edges, we finally got the doorway clear and pulled the doors open and burst out into the store. Guns were drawn, pointed at us from every angle. One of the men from the truck spoke first, his voice gruff and authoritative. Uh, you got two options the way I see it, kids. Come back quietly to the farm, finish the game, or you can try to escape, and we'll shoot you in the head. Take your pick. I looked at Christine. There was nothing else to say. We'll go back to the farm. Back outside, a million thoughts were running through my mind. Terms. The men had used odds and bets on escape. Were there people betting on us? Was that what this was all about? Some sick game like the gladiators in ancient Roman times? Were they betting 
on which of us would kill each other, which of us would survive. My instincts said yes, but there was another bet on the table. A bet for us to escape. And I wanted more than anything to make sure that that person won their wager. They were marching us out to the truck unrestrained when I heard a familiar sound again. It took me a moment to place what it was in my mind, and then I remembered what I had thought was a wolf coming up the stairs from the basement back at the farmhouse. The soft padding of toe beans and sharp click of claws hitting the ground. I spun around at the sound of screams and saw blood jetting from the throat of one of the men. A flash of gray and whatever it was that had killed him was suddenly gone. He fell over, clutching his neck to no avail, as the bright red arterial blood shot out between his fingers. We were close to the truck now, and I wondered if whatever had attacked him had ducked behind it for cover or underneath. Either way, it was gone in a flash. What the hell? Get in! Get in! The man in charge was yelling. His compadre was laying on the ground, bleeding out, and left him there to die as they hauled us towards the truck and opened the doors to throw us inside. Another blur of gray went by, and another one went to the ground, writhing in pain and bleeding all over the roadway, screaming, clutching his neck. There was only two men left now, evening the odds considerably, especially since they hadn't bothered to restrain us, feeling confident in their numbers. Ignoring my fear, I elbowed the man closest to me in the face, and he fell to his knees. I kicked him as hard as I could in the gut, and he fell over, writhing in pain. He began to reach for his gun, and I gave him one more hard kick, this time to the chin, and he went down hard on his face and laid still. Christine had always been tough as nails, so it didn't surprise me that she managed to incapacitate the leader of the crew while I was busy with the other guy. It helped that she had a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, something that the people running this operation apparently had overlooked. Before I could say a word, she had snapped the boss's arm, and a sharp piece of bone was protruding from the skin, jettisoning blood into the air like a fountain as he screamed in agony. Nice one, I said, fist bumping her. Uh, let's get the hell out of here, okay? She nodded, and we got into the truck. I turned the key in the ignition, and the big hemi engine roared to life. Backing out of the spot I was parked in, I saw Wolf running away from the scene fast as lightning. The same wolf from the basement, I guessed. Another question without an answer. Maybe one day I would find out what the hell had happened, what miracle had saved us here. It turned out I would get an answer sooner than expected. Uh, was that a wolf? Yeah, it definitely was. Christine's confused expression probably matched my own, but... We didn't have time to think about it more than that. We began driving out of town, and I saw police lights flashing in the distance behind us. I had no intention of pulling over, though, not while we were in this jurisdiction. There was just one final obstacle between us and the borders of this horrifying island. The bridge. It was an old drawbridge that could be raised occasionally to allow larger boats to pass through below. I assumed that was a rare occurrence out here in no man's land, though. Uh, sure enough, though, as we brought the car around the corner, I saw the bridge was raised. The yellow dotted line on the pavement facing us surreally from the sky as we approached. Our only way off the island was cut off and unusable, at least for the moment. Getting closer, I felt the sweat on my palms, the ticking beat of my heart becoming a pounding drum. It'll go back through. It's just a boat passing through, I told Christine, but even I didn't believe it. As we got to the lowered arm of a safety barrier just before the bridge, I noticed a placard had been attached to it. Escape from Kilgore Farm is not permitted. Please turn around and return to your new home. Thank you, management. We got out of the car and walked on stilted, trembling legs towards the edge of the water. 
past the barricade and its ringing alarms, past the other signs and ignoring the police siren, drawing closer from behind us. The two of us stood looking down at the brackish waters far below. Of course, there were no boats that would cause anyone to raise the drawbridge. There was no one even manning this thing. No control booth visible. It was all being done remotely by whoever was running this twisted game. The only escape was down. A straight drop from a 90 degree cliff and the depths of the water could not be determined from where we stood. I imagined sharp rocks hiding just below the surface. Far, far below us, I could see slightly white-capped waves. It would be a long drop, and I wasn't even sure it was survivable. You know, I just remembered something, Christine said from back in Catholic school. How this was relevant, I wasn't quite sure. Saint Ajuder. That name sounded so familiar. I couldn't figure out why until just now. She started to laugh. That sounded slightly unhinged. It's because it's one of the odd saints. Odd saints? Yeah, that's what I always called them anyways, she said, untying her shoes. I did a project on them once in school. Saint Ajuder is the patron saint of swimmers. I looked at Christine and she nodded. We both kicked off our shoes and took a few deep breaths. Behind us I saw more black trucks driving our way police car in front. They would be here any second, and they would probably kill us on sight. We took a few deep breaths and counted down. One, two, three! Leaping from the cliff down into that water was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. I did it despite my fear of heights and of drowning because of the fear of what was behind us. It was so much more terrifying. The steel blue water raced up at me and the white capped waves grew larger and larger as I fell, trying to make myself as straight upright as I could. The time through the air seemed to last forever as my stomach rose up into my throat. And finally, after what felt like forever. I impacted the water with such force that it felt like I might have a broken foot. Luckily, I didn't. We both somehow survived the drop and came up to the surface, gasping for air. And on the other side of the strait was another sheer cliff face, going 90 degrees straight up. I realized with growing apprehension there was nowhere for us to go. We could swim to the other side, but we couldn't climb up it. And there was no shoreline on the other side as far as the eye could see. Treading water, we heard voices above us. It was the people chasing us, I realized. They began to fire guns down at us, trying to kill us. The shots zipped into the water around us, making almost invisible splashes. Shit, we gotta go. I dove down into the water and began to swim to the other side, opening my eyes to see bullets raining down from the surface all around us. We swam as fast as we could and we're out of breath by the time we got to the other side. The sheer cliff face was gray rock that had no footholds or handholds to give us purchase for a rest. It was like it had been sanded totally smooth. My endurance was already being tested, but we continued along the rock wall trying to get away. I noticed we were out of range of their guns now, at least unless one of them had a sniper rifle. But that relief lasted only a second as I saw the drawbridge was being brought down. They were coming for us. The two of us continued to swim until it felt like we had no energy left. My legs were already weak and tired from the walk into town, and now they were like chunks of concrete weighing me down. My head began to go underwater, going into my nose and my mouth occasionally. 
Christine was struggling too, I could see by the exhausted, terrified expression on her face. What the hell is that? She said suddenly. Up ahead, something was floating, bobbing up and down in the current. Holy shit, we're saved! I began to swim with renewed energy, seeing a small motorboat up ahead tied to the rock wall. It was about a hundred yards away. My muscles were cramping and I felt like I was suffocating, not getting enough air in my lungs as the water pressed in on my tired body. But I swam and struggled forward, finally reaching the motorboat. The two of us climbed in. There was a cooler and a gas tank inside the boat, but that was all, aside from the motor attached to the stern. I pulled open the lid of the cooler, having flashbacks to the gift boxes at Kilgore Farm, and saw... Instead of a decapitated head, there was water, food, and other drinks inside. And there was also an envelope. Tearing open the paper, I opened a letter which was folded inside. It read as follows. Congratulations on escaping Kilgore Farm. Thank you for playing the killing game. A little operation run by yours truly. To sum it up briefly, we bring people out to a secluded farm and set them against each other through elaborate means. Some very rich and very powerful people bet on the outcomes of these death matches. It's really quite fun. I'm impressed you all managed to avoid killing each other until midnight, when the time limit ran out and the standard call was set to begin. Not only that, but you were the first ones ever to escape. However, you did not do so without some assistance. I was getting a bit tired of my measly income from this project, and wanted to retire after this round, to be honest. I've been planning this evening's activities for quite a while. I brought in a partner a CEO from a robotics company. She bet a large sum of money on your escape, which others were more than happy to bet against. She's the one responsible for the robotic wolf who dispatched your attackers. Quite ingenious, if I do say so myself. But don't get too excited. See, I wanted to retire so I could finally enjoy... A hobby of mine. I never had enough time, since Kilgore Farm consumed so much of my energy. It was my life's work, after all. But now, I finally get to do the thing I love most. Hunting. And you two are going to be a part of it. Now the real killing game begins. I'll give you a 30-minute head start. All the best. Ramsey. Some people bet on dogs. Others gamble on roulette or card games at a casino. But a very small group of people, a group of secretive and extremely wealthy people, bet on something different altogether. They gamble on the people at Kilgore Farm. They gamble on murder. The killing game, they call it. And it was just about to begin. Betting is now closed, said Ramsey from the front of the room. You may, of course, continue to make side wagers amongst yourselves, but the house odds are now set. He paused for dramatic effect. One thing struck me. Looking over the spreadsheets, one of you, I won't say who, chose the bet with the biggest payout and subsequently the longest odds. Brief muted laughter broke out, but then was quickly silenced as Ramsey put his hand up. He pointed up above them at the ceiling and put a finger to his lips as if to say, quiet. Of course, there was no chance of anyone actually hearing them from up above, but it added to the dramatic effect. I can see you all know what this means. One of you actually gambled on a successful escape. 
I'm glad to see the rest of you have faith in the process we have developed. Fortunately for you, that means you will all very likely see a tidy profit at the end of the night due to the sizable bet this person has made on our guests. How tidy of a profit are we talking about here? Asked someone from the back of the room who was quickly hushed into silence. Shh! All in due time, all in due time. The married couple could be seen rolling up to their newly purchased home in the moving truck from several different angles. The hidden cameras concealed in a thousand different places all over the property. In the town nearby and in the forest between the two places, their voices could be heard in high-quality audio as they came to a stop and got out of the vehicle. A dozen men and women dressed in black clothing stood watching the vast array of high-quality video monitors sipping champagne. The austere room, which was dimly lit but full of luxuries, plates of caviar served by tuxedo-wearing waiters, leather recliners and sofas were arranged around the fine marble tables and crystal chandeliers hung from the ceiling above. The crowd of men and women watched the video feeds with keen interest and awaited what would happen next. Side bet, straight up odds, said a woman with red hair and emerald green eyes. Ten million says hubby pisses himself before midnight. I'll take that action. Might as well spend some of this free cash. Can you believe somebody bet against us all? Replied a man with spiked blonde hair and a well-built physique. He took a sip of his drink and set it back down where it was immediately refilled with finely aged single malt scotch. No one so much as batted an eye at the promise of ten million. There were much larger bets on the table than that, after all. It's absurd. Nobody has ever come close to escaping. I put down fifty times more than usual. Seeing how skewed the odds were, I've never seen such a sure thing in my life. Probably some idiot with newfound wealth and a virgin too, I'll bet. All of them observed the monitors as the couple went into the house and listened to their stunned words at the state of the wretched place. Q gift number one, said Ramsey, the microphone on his earpiece picking up the words, no matter how softly spoken. A perfectly concealed panel opened up on the top step of the front porch, and a package wrapped in sports-themed gift wrap came out from the darkness. The panel closed again, and everything seemed just the same as before, except, except for the present now sitting on the doorstep, waiting to be found. The new group smiled at the technological magic trick, waiting for the couple to find the box. Think they'll open it before the rest of them arrive? Unlikely. ETA is less than five minutes. Shame. That might have made things more interesting, but they never open the package right away, do they, Ramsey? That's what I heard. It's like nobody wants to know what's inside of it. They're scared. Wouldn't you be? Fear of the unknown is the greatest of them all. The couple didn't get the box open in time. It was a matter of a second or two, but the others got there at the last possible moment and delayed the inevitable. The head in the box would have to wait for now, as would the chaos it would almost certainly cause. It wasn't until later that evening that the gift box was finally opened, the head revealed, and how fitting, it was the jock himself who did it. Ramsey wondered who would turn first, as he always did. It wouldn't take long for the rest of the dominoes to topple over after that. Ramsey, when's the fun gonna start, man? Asked one of the rowdier ones, new money. Soon. Soon. He struggled to remember the head fund fucker's name. Chase? No, that wasn't it. C Carter? That was the prick's name. Very soon, Carter. Right now, in fact. He pointed at the monitor. Hubby was going upstairs to check the windows. They had finally realized what was in the box, now were making a half-hearted attempt to secure the place. He chuckled to himself, thinking about the large picture window in the living room, glazed with reflective coating on the inside so they could see nothing through them unless the room was completely dark. That had been his idea. The huge window would give them no sense of security whatsoever, knowing it could be smashed in at any second. Cue the Reapers. 
He said, and immediately heard a 10-4 of confirmation in his earpiece. Hubby was looking out the window into the cornfield. He'd seen them. He was sure of it. They always did. Ramsey awaited patiently and then saw what he wanted to see on the monitors. The husband was yelling out the window at the reapers, asking what they wanted. Cue dispersal. Prepare the immediate return. You guys know the drill. The look on the face of the husband was priceless, as were the looks of the attendees in the room. They all lit up with huge grins and the room broke into an excited chatter. Holy shit! You see the look on his face when he saw them all? Th that was priceless! Did he piss himself yet? Nope, not yet. Ramsey let them go on for a few minutes until it was obvious the husband, Jordan, was going down into the basement. Then he shot a look at his lead technical assistant and nodded. Okay, quiet down, everyone. He said with authority. Everyone stopped talking almost immediately. Thank you. Now, we're going to be getting to the meat and potatoes of tonight's entertainment in just a moment. What I ask is that each of you keep the end goal in mind. We want a slowly building sense of dread, a lack of communication, think constant assaults from multiple angles, and we want to do one thing more than anything. What is that one thing? So, so distrust. Distrust. So distrust. distrust. The group said in unison, like a crowd of school children in a well-rehearsed play. Good. Good. Nobody jumped the gun. I don't want anybody physically injured just yet. We want to scar them emotionally before we scar them physically. Everyone got that? The group nodded, for the most part. It was difficult with rich people. They always felt like they needed to have the upper hand. A few of them were stubbornly silent. Okay, you'll each have received your VR headset by now. Put them on and feel free to have a bit of fun as your chosen basement relic. Bonus points if you can manage to escape the basement. Everyone put on their VR headsets and took their control paddles in their hands. Ramsey's heart began to beat a little faster. This was where things would start to deviate from normal. He had done this a hundred times, and this was going to be the last night at Kilgore Farms for him. He was tired of it, and he was retiring from it. He looked over at one of the guests, Wei Li. She nodded, putting on her headset. Her associate, another guest named Kirk, looked at him with a meaningful glance, then put on his own specially modified rig. Greg and Jordan were down in the basement and the group had their fun toying with them, moving the mannequin and the ventriloquist dummy and all the other toys around, making them panic just enough for his liking. Meanwhile, Ramsey cued the release of the second box. It rose up on an elevator and appeared at the bottom of the basement stairs, just moments before Greg stumbled upon it. Two boxes were now in play. Hubby and his high school chum raced upstairs and the next doppelganger head was revealed moments later. Everything went smoothly after that. As planned, nobody died before midnight, ensuring another tidy bit of profit for Ramsey. The group in front of him did not even seem annoyed by this substantial loss. They expected a much bigger payout at the end of the night. A hint of a smile played across his lips. They were going to be supremely disappointed. All of the funds were managed by wire transfers. The terms were non-negotiable. He was going to be a very rich man once the night was through. And then he could enjoy his retirement. He could enjoy his hunt. The players were locked in the rooms upstairs, just as planned following the signaling of midnight. He had kept all the gamblers distracted by playing with the basement door, allowing them to escape from the basement with their chosen relics. While they were busy doing that, he made sure that Wei's associate escaped the house through a hidden door, running off into the woods. The wolf was a well-designed weapon of warfare, capable of incredibly high speeds and able to dismember several attackers. Its teeth were titanium, its body lined with high-tech, lightweight, bulletproof material. It would play an important role in the couple's eventual escape down the line. Ramsey was surprised to see one of the players actually did turn on his friend. But instead of one of them killing the other, Greg, the instigator of the argument, found himself impaled on his own knife. He laughed to himself, realizing he had slipped on the fake blood in the hallway. How fortuitous. 
Things went exactly according to plan after that. The Reapers pretended to be overwhelmed by the sheer number of escapees. They had actually been told not to stop Jordan and Christine from escaping as part of the show. They put on a lengthy chase, but eventually the couple got away, escaping to the village. Of course, there was an aspect of risk to the whole operation. He couldn't let the Reapers in on the plan, since several of them were going to be killed as a part of it. The only other person in on the plan besides the three of them was his technical assistant, who was keeping the camera angles perfectly turned so that the guests only saw what he wanted them to see. The guests who were gambling on the event would be disappointed when they left, sure, but they would also have an experience that they would remember for the rest of their lives, and that would satisfy them. At the end of the night, as they were filtering out of the room, he found himself surprised when they clapped him on the back, thanking him for the pleasure of taking their money. That was quite the show. I can't believe they actually escaped. Damn it, Ramsey. You outdid yourself. I'll be back next year. You can count on that. That was funny, he thought. He certainly wouldn't be here if they showed up. Wei was the last one in the room. Her assistant had left a long while before that, hiding in another room to operate the wolf remotely. Now he came back and set his VR headset on the table. The couple had made it to the motorboat. They had succeeded, as had Ramsey. His lead technical assistant, Xavier, came over to join them in their discussion and their brief celebration. A bottle of ice-cold champagne was quickly produced. The cork popped, glasses filled to the brim. Well done said Wei. You've accomplished quite a feat. And I couldn't have done it without your assistance. Thank you for helping me retire, finally. I owe you that much. I've been coming to these events for how long now? How many years? Too many to count. He replied. I'm going to miss it, I think. She nodded, thinking for a few moments. I've been thinking, she said about your retirement plans. Oh? I was wondering if you might be interested in one last final wager. He set his glass of champagne down. I'm intrigued. Go on. We have a tidy sum of cash from the game tonight, which we agreed to split 50-50, of course. But what if we made it winner takes all? He already knew the answer to the question he was about to ask, but he asked it anyway. And which game would we be betting on? Her smile was like the devil's. Why, the killing game, of course. You didn't keep those two alive out of the kindness of your heart, after all. I want to go hunting humans with you. All or nothing. What do you say? He'd always loved a lively competition. You're on. <laughs>